Hey everybody, this is Standing for Truth, and the debate that you are about to see is between Bill Morgan, who is a creationist, and Snake Was Right, who is an evolutionist. The debate topic is creation versus evolution. This debate was a blast. It was fun, and it was really engaging, so I hope you enjoy. Let's get right into it. This flat doodle is easily unraveled, so therefore moot in this debate. Skyler and Josh must supply a definition of slavery that isn't concocted from sheer imagination. Is portrayed themselves as a Muslim, and ISIS, the name itself, is after a Babylonian false god. I think you would be a biochemical predestinarian, which would mean all your thoughts and decisions are just predestined as well. Gamma G kicks on and then gamma A for the remainder of the pregnancy, and then those turn off and then the last one turns on. So if I'm looking at a gene pool, and I agree evolution would be defined as change in allele frequency over time, uh, obviously in populations, not individuals are evolving, but populations are evolving. Did your brain have a designer? No. No. I believe you. Go ahead. <laughs> Please tell me how the respiration system of a, a reptile that uses a bellows two-pass system evolves into a single pass with air sacs and no diaphragm. Just a step-by-step -step idea. Yeah, that would take a long time. Welcome to Christian Debate Consortium. This is Praise I Am That I Am. I'm excited to present this enthralling debate between two experienced debaters on the topic of creation versus evolution. Uh, without further ado, here is Standing for Truth. Awesome. Thanks for that, Praise. Uh, thanks so much, Bill Morgan. And uh, Snake was right for doing this, for giving us your time. A lot of people are excited. I'm really excited. So this is going to be awesome. Uh, just like Praise said, please subscribe. we got a lot of good debates coming up. Uh, we've hosted a lot of debates. Our first one on, on the uh, Christian Debate Consortium was just last week between Ken Hoven and Adam Heap on the Global Flood. So a lot of good feedback there as well, guys. Go and check that out. Um, at the end of the month so far, um, we've got uh, Ken Hoven again debating emotionally stunted emoticon uh, on the Global Flood versus uniformitarianism. So lots to look forward to on this channel, guys. Um, so we got a formal debate tonight. It is going to be 15-minute openings. We're going to start with Bill Morgan, followed by eight-minute rebuttals. 30 minute discussion. So a lot of fun there. I know that's a lot of people's favorite parts of, of the debate. We've got a concluding statements of five minutes and then a question and answer. So make sure you tag um, either standing for truth or raw mat in the chat with your questions. And we will save those and, and make sure we ask them at, at the end there. So uh, what we'll do is we will hand it off to Bill who's going to start with his opening presentation. So Bill. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Bill Morgan. Thank you for sponsoring the debate. Uh, Taylor, thank you for talking the subject with me. I've been a mechanical engineer for 35 and a half years, and I enjoy talking about creation versus evolution. And this debate is which is the better explanation. Creationists believe at the core that there is a creator, a designer. Creationists typically believe that the creator is supernatural and has an IQ that approaches infinity. Okay, so some uh, important topics that we can discuss, a uh, question for Taylor that uh, I will discuss. How did matter and energy originate? What is your best explanation? I never ask, how do you know? Because nobody knows. I wasn't there, you weren't there. But what's the best explanation for matter and energy's origination? The first law of thermodynamics teaches that matter and energy is neither created nor destroyed. So a translation, matter and energy does not poof from nothing by natural means. That is a law of science, yet we do have a lot of matter and energy. The second law of thermodynamics teaches us that matter and energy are functions of time and thus not eternal. So if matter and energy cannot appear from nothing and is not eternal, I believe the best explanation is a supernatural explanation. And that explanation conforms with two laws of thermodynamics. Next question for Taylor is how did life originate? 
What is your best explanation? Once again, neither one of us was there, but what are the best tools that we can use? Well, we can address the law of biogenesis and the cell theory that teaches that life only comes from life. Now, not only do we have this strong theory and law, we have observation. Everything that we see, life only comes from life. My dead dogs in the past, it'd be great if they could come back to life, but they're not, and we all know that they won't, okay? Very important question. Uh, do you think humans have human or humans have bacterial ancestors? Neither one of us were there at the origin. Was there only bacteria in the beginning? And are they our ancestors? Uh, here is electron microscope image of bacteria on the head of a pin. Thousands and thousands of bacteria. This is not meant to be a smart aleck question, but the debate is really, is this our cousin? I can think of many reasons that it's not. In the time of Darwin, when they thought the cell was a blob or protoplasm, it might have been fashionable or cute to think that it could change into different organisms. But my belief is with our knowledge of DNA, genetics, and biochemistry, it's undefendable to think that bacteria is the ancestor to humans. So, simply put, I'm a simple guy. I believe apes make apes, people make people, bacteria make bacteria, ladybugs make ladybugs. Many people will say that's a religious belief, but it is not. It's supported by genetics, biochemistry, taxonomy, zoology, paleontology. All of the allergies support people make people and bacteria make bacteria. So quick address on what science is. The most important part of science is observation. But science starts with an idea. You make more money if you call it a hypothesis, but it starts with an idea. You test your ideas by making observations, and then you reach a conclusion. Suppose I had an idea or a hypothesis that this pen could fly. You would say, show me. Well, I drop it one, two, a million, a billion trillion times my pen or doesn't fly. That this pen could... It'd be irreasonable for, unreasonable for me to say pens could fly. The observations don't support my hypothesis. Many people think humans have bacteria ancestors. That's a hypothesis. It's taught as a conclusion, but I feel what's missing is the observational evidence. I feel many evolutionists have the idea, the conclusions, and they're desperately seeking for evidence. Well, conclusions should always be based upon observation, not the hypothesis. Okay? So, I believe microevolution is true. Bacteria plus mutation equals mutated bacteria. That's observed. I have no problem at all with uh, microevolution. I think it's part of the wisdom of the creator. However, macroevolution believes bacteria plus mutation plus time plus natural selection equals blue whales. I believe that to be completely false. I don't believe those little guys on the head of that pin are related to blue whales. Okay. Now, bacteria can reproduce in 20 minutes. You can go from one to two billion in eight hours. That is a lot of generations. For many, many years, people have been studying bacteria. It's an important thing to study. And after billions, maybe trillions of generations, bacterium reproduction has been observed, and it's only making bacteria. Now, some people say, well, creationists don't have any predictions. Yes, we do. We predict that every bacteria that reproduces tomorrow will be bacteria. Every fish will give birth to a fish, every human to a human. So we do make predictions that that is what we would observe, and it's genetics. Look at all those people, eight or many, many billions of people. What do we observe? Every person in that picture, human parents human grandparents, human great-grandparents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mitochondrial DNA can teach us that everybody in that picture, everybody on the planet has the same female ancestor. Goes back right to the, the beginning and they call her mitochondrial Eve, which I think is a very powerful argument for creation that people make people. Mitochondria does not go beyond Eve, okay? 
We're going to get high tech here. Many years ago, my daughters were playing with uh, farm animals, and here comes dad. And dad said, did you know the pig's mom is a horse? My daughter said, no, it's not, dad. But what is it? The pig's mom is a pig. I said, well, honey, I'm going to send you to Berkeley, and they'll beat that right out of you. I believe many, many people have vast more knowledge, of course, than my kids. But wisdom is important. Wisdom is perhaps more important. I believe a person who believes pigs make pigs, horses make horses, okay? So can we be 100% certain something is the result of design? My answer to that is no. If it was in the past, you cannot be 100% certain that it was a design. Here's my example. Suppose you come home from school, you walk up your driveway, you see 15 stones in that pattern. Would the best explanation be the pattern is the result of design or chance? Somebody might say chance, it's scattered and random, and that's a good guess, but they can't be sure because they weren't there. Suppose you come home from school, you walk up your driveway, and you see this on your driveway, six stones in a straight line. Now you might say, you know what? I'm pretty sure that's a design. In fact, I'm 99% sure, but you can't be 100% sure because you weren't there. So I'd be willing to say 99% sure, 1% faith, but it's not blind faith. It's a logical, rational faith. Suppose you come home from school and you see 150 stones in a circle on your driveway. What would your guess be, design or chance? You can never be 100% sure, but you could be 99.9999 with a lot of nines. Sure, just a little bit of faith. You will always have faith when you are guessing about what happened in the past. But once again, it's not a blind faith. If you think that happened by chance, it's the inverse of chance or faith versus belief. I believe the chance people have much more faith than the creationists. Let's talk about the human eye. What's more complex, stones in a circle or the human eye? Okay. So, polite question for Taylor. Do you think human eyes are the result of design or the result of chance? Let's start at the beginning. The cornea focuses 75% of light in the eye. Pretty cool accomplishment. The cornea is the only tissue in humans that do not get oxygen from blood. The reason for this is if blood vessels were in your cornea, you could not see. Nobody wants me to pour blood on their windshield because they won't be able to see and I'll get beat up. So the creator knew this and gave us a clear cornea so we could see. Designer chance, just the cornea alone, I think, screams of design. Trochlea, I used to call this a trochlea, I'll be honest, but it's a trochlea. Inside our eye socket, we got a little bit of cartilage that looks like an upside down U. Look at this, think, is this a designer chance? The muscle goes through it goes up the trochlea to the eye. Now, how in the world could this evolve by chance over time? You first get that little trochlea and that muscle weaves its way through and then attaches to the eye. This is the product of fantastic design. At least that's my opinion, okay? Rods and cones. Rods and cones are amazing. And I'm gonna be real simple because I'm not that smart. Rods and cones convert light to an electrical impulse. The complexity is unbelievable. And it's just, the concept is unbelievable that light is converted to an electrical impulse. And you've got millions of cones, millions of rods in the area of a quarter. How does that happen by time, nature, and chance? I believe in a designer with an IQ of infinity. So that electrical impulse travels down your optic nerve, you got 1.7 nerve fibers in less than a tenth of an inch, carries that information to your visual cortex. Now, aren't you glad we have skulls and hair? How'd you like to see that walking around? But anyways, uh, the data goes to the visual cortex and your brain interprets. So think about this. Everything you see on the screen is an electrical signal that your visual cortex translates to vision. I believe the creator who I believe to be God is infinitely brilliant designer. This is not the result of chance. Let's talk about urination. Everybody does it every day. Urination does not begin in the kidneys. It begins in the brain. 
Right now, as we speak, our hypothalamus is measuring how much water is in our blood. If we have too much water in the blood, it releases a hormone to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland releases it, it goes to the kidney. The kidney receives it and either releases the water to the bladder, or if we are low on water, it recirculates this. This is an amazingly designed control system with feedback. I'm not the best engineer in the world, but I can tell you these things do not happen by chance. Fantastic, beautiful design. Okay. Oh, and not to get disgusting, but you can live to be 100 years old and not once does blood come out in your urine. Imagine a filtration system that can take out the water from the blood, but none of the blood. Once again, great design. Very important thing to know, the human body is not a thing. It's a system. The human body is a system composed of many systems, okay? The human body has a circulatory system. The heart is a system. The cells are a system. The molecules are a system. The atoms are a system. Systems cannot evolve in living things by a step-by-step -step process. Vision is a system. We just talked about the, the, the cornea, the retina, the rods, the cones, the optic nerve. It all has to work. This can happen by a step-by-step -step system. What evolved first? The visual cortex, the optic nerve, the eye, everything has to be there in place. And for the human body, for you to be alive, you need all of your systems in place at the same time. You don't have a month to, to evolve a digestive system. All of the systems need each other. Systems in living things cannot evolve step by step. So a polite question to uh, Taylor, how do you explain all the different systems in the human body? Which one evolved first? Which one evolved last? Okay. Regarding the eye, what evolved first? The cornea, the lens, the rods, the cones, the optic nerve, the visual cortex? I'm sure you get my point. Okay. Real quick on natural selection. Suppose you had two dogs. You took them to Alaska. One's furry, one's hairless. You come home and you forget your dogs. Well, the dogs fall in love and get married and make puppies. They make some furry, some hairless. Here comes a winter. What's going to happen? Those beautiful hairless dogs are going to freeze to death. The furry dogs survive. They, make, they get married, and they make mostly furry dogs. They could make a hairless dog, but the One next minute. winter is going to wipe him out. In a short amount of time, the only dogs in Alaska will be furry. That's natural selection. It's 100% true. But is it evidence that dogs have bacterial ancestors? Absolutely not. Science tells us dogs make dogs. So questions for Taylor. How did matter and energy originate? How did life originate? Do you think humans have bacteria ancestors? Are eyes the result of time and chance or design? Which system evolved first in the human body and what part of vision evolved first? Okay. I think my time's up. Close enough. Perfect. All right. Snake, whenever you're ready, I will start when your presentation is up and ready to go. Okay. All right. Sharing screen. All right. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So. I study uh, molecular biology in school, um, and so evolution, even on the biochemical scale, it's pretty much uh, seems like second nature to me. Um, and uh, so it's really interesting to get into, you know, why people don't understand it and things like that. Um, so I'm going to try and address most of your questions. Uh, anything I don't cover, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into. Um, but first of all, he asks, uh, how met, how do matter and energy originate? And um, uh, I'm just going to say this has nothing to do with uh, this debate uh, because of evolution. Uh, matter and energy, the origin of matter and energy don't have anything to do with evolution. Evolution doesn't explain the origin of energy and matter. It only explains the diversity of life. Uh, and same with the question of how did life originate? Same response. Um, evolution does not address the origin of life. It only addresses how life changes. Um, so I'm, I'm an atheist, but I will actually grant you 
for the purposes of this debate, God created the first life, and that doesn't actually touch the subject of evolution. So we don't know what the first life was. Um, uh, another question, we do not have bacterial ancestors. We have a shared ancestor with bacteria, um, but the, an the single-celled ancestors that we do have were not bacteria, and that's why bacteria probably possess some sort of uh, feature that suits them best to be single-celled and not to group up into uh, multicellular uh, types of bodies. Um, we are made up of cells and single cells can communicate with each other. And so all that really would have to happen on an evol evolutionary scale would be that uh, single cells learn how to communicate differently and how to adhere to each other. And um, actually uh, the immune system is a pretty good example of how we have cells literally just crawling around in our bodies that are still our cells and they communicate very like very complex ways with each other um and it, but it's all feedback loops so it's it's easy to understand at, at a chemical level um not easy to memorize all the letters and numbers that they go by but um okay and um as for apes make apes uh Yes, that's true. And uh, but the thing that you guys seem to be missing is apes make different apes every generation. They don't make clones of themselves. They make every generation is different. Every child is different. Um, and so I'm glad that you accept microevolution so we can skip over uh, uh, some of this stuff. Um, the reason that uh, scientists accept evolution is because it produces results. Uh, Cures and materials, um, we actually can cure diseases, research diseases. We can find fossils that uh, have never been found before. We can predict their features. We can, uh, using the sciences that surround uh, the theory of evolution, such as radiometric dating, um, we can certainly find um, certain rock strata and we can use other geological methods to find minerals and things like that. And so, we know that those methods are reliable and make good predictions. So those, so um, they can be used for other sciences. Um, and so going back to apes, will always make apes. Fish will always make fish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would not classify that as a novel prediction, which is what actually matters in this. So you can make the prediction the sun will come up tomorrow based on your model, and no one will care because we all know the sun will come up. Uh, same with evolution. Evolution says dogs will produce dogs and fish will produce fish. It's just there's a little bit slight of a caveat there. Each generation will be slightly different. A fish will produce a fish, but the fish will be a little bit different every time. Um, and you already acknowledge this with uh, microevolution. Um, just touching on mitochondrial Eve for a second, that just refers to an individual whose genes managed to spread across the whole population. Uh, it doesn't mean that that was the original or a, some are uh, a member of a original bottleneck. Um, it reminds me of kind of the classic Kent Hovind uh, misconception where he thinks that two members of the same species must have the same uh, mutant gene at the same time uh, for a gene to spread. And that's not how genes spread. They can just spread throughout the population through normal breeding. Um, and I'm glad you admit that there's no way to, uh, actually know whether something is designed or not. Um, and so your question would be, what's a better explanation? And the way scientists address this question is whichever model produces more results. So as soon as your model starts producing results, uh, that are as good as evolution, it will completely destroy and supplant evolution as a science, but that's not happening. Evolution does produce results, and creationism does not produce results. Um, uh, for your example with the rocks in the driveway, if your hypothesis was correct, you might be able to uh, predict uh, when and where someone might come out and start rearranging the rocks. You might predict where a good hiding spot would be to uh, catch them. And this is based on your hypothesis. If I thought it was just raining rocks, then I might be looking up at the sky all day and uh, I would never find out what the true, what the truth is. And so the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in your model. Um, let's see. And uh, 
if there's a designer with uh, IQ of infinity, uh, I would question why the, he makes um, so many creatures with uh, unoptimized designs. So there's several swimming creatures. Some of them have better designs than others, even though they have the same habitat, same size, same coloration, same prey, um, and yet they have different swimming methods entirely. Uh, a designer using common uh, common tools and who understands what they're doing would probably optimize those things. Um, and as for human eyes, it's uh, actually we have uh, we have animals that exist with every stage of the proposed eye evolution um, that actually exist. Um, this proves that uh, the various stages in this evolution are stable and uh, while still being able to improve. So the Nautilus, for example, has an eyeball that's hollowed out. Um, and so I don't know if you can see this right now, but uh, essentially once you have light sensitive cells, the, uh, the flesh can uh, invaginate a pocket into the, the main body of the organism and this will, and as long as you still have the light sensitive cells lining the inside of it, this can actually improve the function of an eye. And we know that uh, this different morphology can take place due to mutation. Um, let's see here. How much time do I have left? Sorry, I was on mute. You have six minutes. Okay. Um, so I would like to focus the discussion uh, mostly on uh, this topic of how evolution actually works. Um, and so I'm going to be uh, repeating kind of uh, modification with descent, uh, how things repurpose and refine existing traits and information to create new traits. Um, so for example, it, in 2016, they did a study on... Uh, on bearded dragons and uh, a few other animals, and they discovered that um, hairs, scales, and feathers all all grow from the same type of uh, anatomical appendage in um, embryos. And so this exact same skin feature will eventually diversify. And we, as we all know, um, hair, scales, and feathers are all made of keratin. So. This is just a repurposing of something that already exists. And a scale, essentially, is just a thickening of the skin cells. And a hair is just a very thin version of that. And a feather would be an even further modified uh, version of a scale or a type of hair-like appendage. Uh, all made out of the same stuff, all born out of the same appendage, or same uh, skin growth. Um, and on, in terms of modification with descent, the only difference between the proposed early birds and, uh, and late theropods is basically the length of their fingers and the length of the feathers on their arms. Uh, we know that theropods already walk on two legs. We already know, we know that they already have feathers. So uh, how is it out of the question that a mutation would elongate their fingers and their arm feathers, and this could produce, this could provide all kinds of benefits. Um, this is a snail that would seem to fly through the ocean. Um, this is just a modification of the flaps that snails already have. Um, you guys probably noticed this earlier. This is called a frogfish. It, its legs, uh, if you actually look at the kind of the finger appendages, they look a lot like frogs. Um, I mean, the whole thing looks like a frog to me. Um, but you notice how these fins actually have articulated joints. And you can see that they're using those, uh, those bones as fingers. So it's just repurposing of something that's already there. It's not a new feature. It's a different feature. It's a modified feature. Um, same feature, perhaps a different function. So I'm also going to want to try and pin down wh where the uh, boundaries between kinds are, such as between crustaceans, um, anything really, snakes, lizards, 
reptiles of any kind. Can you tell me whether or not crocodiles are related to lizards? Because looking at their morphology, it would just seem that they have larger, thicker scales, larger bodies, larger teeth, and mostly have the same morphology. Uh, so modifying a lizard into a crocodile should be un easy to understand from a microevolutionary standpoint. Um, <clears throat> and I understand we, we haven't, you haven't really gone over uh, definitions of kinds, but I just want to try and nip it in the bud as fast as possible. Um, most creationists tend to define a kind as something that brings forth with each other, but there are several species which have diversified far enough from their base form uh, so that they can no longer bring forth with each other. And yet we can tell by morphology alone that they are the same kind, um, as you would say. Uh, this is called comparative anatomy, and this is how uh, creationists do baromenology, and this is how essentially scientists do a phylogeny. Um, so, for example, I would ask if you could point out to me at what point are these no longer the same kind? At any point. Um, and so I think that's probably a good point to stop there. I'll see the rest of my time. Okay. All right. You were stopped at 1230. So uh, two and a half minutes added on to discussion. All right. Uh, so we're moving into the rebuttal round, I guess now, right? Eight minutes. All right. Okay. Um, sounds like you uh, threw in most of your rebuttal in your opening <laughs> stay. But we'll do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Bill, whenever you are ready, I will start the time for eight minutes. All right. Let's see if this works. Oh, trying to get my slides to change again. Oh. Last time, somehow the screen got a little bit smaller and my slides started to work again. Yeah, you gotta learn. It's it's. I got to probably go through this oh. myself. There we go. Okay, I don't know what happened, but okay. Uh, this is an evolution versus creation debate, and evolution. And I have a slide for it. Evolutionists often say, "Well, it doesn't address the origin of the universe or the origin of life." And I say this respectfully. If I were an evolutionist, I would run like heck from those questions too, because they're a, a big challenge, perhaps a pie in the face to an atheist. But this is a creation debate. I'm a creationist. And so I love to talk about the big picture. Uh, this is a slide I invented. Suppose I said, hey, Taylor, let's talk about baseball. And he said, great, let's do it. But I only want to talk about the ninth inning. Well, creationists like to talk about the whole game. And that's a big part of the picture of how we got here. And I just think uh, it's convenient uh, for uh, evolutionists to save perhaps their pride by ignoring the question, but it shouldn't be ignored. If you're an atheist, Tyler, or Taylor, I'm sorry, dig deep into the origin of matter, energy, and life, because truth is our goal, and that's what we need to do. Um, I'm glad you conceded God created first life. I, I agree with you on that, and absolutely, I have no problem if you say the first life wasn't bacteria, but it was a single cell organism, and I would I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would guess that you would say, yes, humans do have single cell organisms. As ancestors, the key is, what is the evidence? What have you seen? You may have heard it's true. You may have read an article, but have your eyes seen everything? You talked about the immune system, one of my favorite systems. It works by the sense of touch. A foreign body comes into us, our body touches it and recognizes it as friend or foe. How in the world does that information and data evolve by chance? Uh, apes make apes, they don't make clones. We agree on microevolution. Uh, you talked about producing results. My predictions produce results. People make people, apes make apes. If you breed dogs, you're gonna make a dog. So uh, I think that's capricious not to say they don't produce results. Uh, radiometric dating, we could do a whole debate on that. Uh, True or false, Tyler, you cannot radiometrically date sedimentary rock. True or false, fossils are found in sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock is rock 
laid down with water from all over the place. You can't radiometrically date it. And the dates for the geological column precede the process of radiometric dating by 50 years. Radiometric dating came around in the 1950s. They assigned the dates of millions of years, 50 years previous. If the dates don't match the radiometric date, they say the, the sample must be contaminated. So it wasn't built by science, okay? Mitochondrial Eve does go way back into the future that we all share the same female ancestor. Uh, you said you can't call something a design by your definition if it produces no results. I, I think that's a very convenient thing to say. Uh, design is something that is a system, performs a function, has levels of complexity, and we could play English word definitions, but I think you know what I mean by design. And uh, uh, unpo you talked about the IQ of the designer. I, I love to think about that. He made predators good to catch stuff. He made prey good to get away. Uh, it doesn't prove non-design. I believe it proves fantastic design. And just talking about my pit bull real quickly, I believe every single hair and every single dog is the result of design. The right location, the right thickness, the right length, the right direction. I look at my dog, every hair is perfect, pointing in the right direction. Every hair on a dog requires a load full of DNA information just for one hair. Uh, I think you kind of ignored the eye argument. You said many different organisms have different types of eyes and you said, hey, here's the sequence. But here's my point. Every eye has to do three things. It has to collect data. It has to move the data and it has to interpret the data. I'm not saying there's all kinds of animals with all kinds of different eyes. I'm saying they're not related because the evolutionary process has to explain how you get the collection, the transport, and the interpretation of data. And I, I hope you understand what I'm saying about that. Okay. Uh, to say a feather is like a scale, uh, it's, it's stunning that, that you would say that. Scales shed, feathers uh, do not. They're completely different. Uh, arrangements, and to believe that a reptile is the ancestor to a bird, I'll go real slow here, you need to believe scales became feathers, front legs became wings, back legs became perching feet, solid bones became hollow bones, cold-blooded became warm-blooded, and my favorite it was in my last debate, the respiration system. Reptiles breathe in, they breathe out. Birds have air sacs where every time they inhale or they exhale, they're pushing air through their lungs. So they get twice the air movement through their lungs. Uh, how in the world does a bellows system of a reptile evolve into a completely different respiration system in a bird without killing it? Chance and mutation messing with the reptile's respiration system is going to kill that poor thing. Uh, it's not going to make it better. Uh, you brought up kinds. And I don't know how much time I have. Which one of these have a common ancestor? Two minutes. Okay. I believe A, B, and C. Which of these is a different kind? I think D. Now, I've heard other debates, and my definition of a kind is on the genetic level. I called John Sanford at Cornell. He invented the gene gun. And I, I believe if you took the DNA of one organism and in vitro fertilized it with another organism, you could see if it's a different kind. And I can get more detail on that later, but I'm running out of time. Uh, ring species. You look at all of these and people would say they're all lizards. And I know evolutionists say that guy on the bottom left is a little different from the one next to him. You go in a big circle and they're not able to reproduce that uh, ring species as proof of speciation. And I agree with speciation, but Jerry Coyne, one of the top uh, evolutionists in the world, and I don't know if you know this, Taylor, he wrote a whole huge article that there are no ring species. He's talking about many gaps between 
the supposed uh, rings. And I, I love these debates because it makes me do research and I learn more and more. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, Tiktaalik, you want to talk about Tiktaalik? Get, look into the details. The fish with the first neck evolved slowly into a land animal. Whenever you read an article, people should ask, what did they actually find? Well, let's talk about Tiktaalik. They have the skull. This is the, the quote that Tiktaalik was an intermediate step between fish and land animals. Wow, I guess they proved it. With physical features from both, allowing the fish to live in shallow water. So we should all be excited and say, what was the actual fossil? Was it a skull? Was it legs? Was it the belly button? Oops, I'm sorry. It was part of the skull and a neck. Now, I'm not the world's smartest guy. I know that for a fact. But how in the world do you look at this and say, oh, that's a transition between a fish and an amphibian? Time. Okay. All right. Snake, you are muted. All right. There we go. Okay. So to touch back on to one of the questions you asked, uh, which system evolved first? Uh, they tend to evolve together at the same time. So they were all primitive and simple, and they all got more complicated together. Um, and uh, so the reason I'm not going to waste time talking about uh, the origin of the universe and energy and matter is because it's irrelevant to evolution. Uh, that should be obvious. Um, and that's why I already granted you that uh, I would uh, grant you that God created the first life because it's actually an irrelevant variable in this discussion. It has nothing to do with evolution. It has nothing to do with whether a single cell can evolve into a multicellular organism, uh, whether God created it or not. Um, it has nothing to do with whether a bird can trans or whether a dinosaur can evolve into a bird. Um, as for how immunology can evolve, uh, you said by sense of touch. Um, well, it's, it's all on a chemical basis. It's literally just two chemicals align and they connect. And uh, it's not by chance. It's actually by selected pressures. So if you have a terrible immune system, you're going to die. If you have a slightly better one, you're going to make more babies than the ones with the terrible immune system. That's the basic thing. Um, but the other part about the immune system is that you actually have competitive uh, lineages inside your own immune cells. So the ones that recognize pathogens are going to proliferate. The ones that don't recognize pathogens are not going to proliferate. They're going to die off um, and they're not going to have a, a lineage. Uh, as for, um, I mean, other immune cells, they mature in, they're actually just modifications of other cells in your body. They mature in the bone marrow uh, and they go through a selection process. If they stick to you, they essentially never make it out of the bone marrow. And then they just flood out into your blood. And if they stick to stuff, they proliferate. Um, and we actually do get glitches in the system. That's how we get allergies. If you have a, an immune response to say peanut butter, that's where you get allergies from. Um, why God couldn't figure out how to make a miraculous system that didn't rec accidentally recognize food, uh, I will probably not understand anytime soon. Um, and uh, no, I don't think creationism does produce results. Uh, what diseases have you cured? Uh, we use evolutionary models every year for the flu vaccines. We use evolutionary models for HIV. Um, that's how we found uh, multiple ways to treat uh, HIV. Some people have actually cured HIV in some patients. Um, we found resistance genes to HIV through evolutionary models. Um, we found multiple fossils through evolutionary models, predicting their date range, predicting their features. Now, you can't just do that randomly. And uh, creationism has not been able to do that because they don't have a model of the rock strata that actually aligns with reality. Um, and I'm going to briefly explain how radiometric dating works. So it, since, based on the question you asked me, it, it seems like you really do not understand how it works. 
Um, so what we do radiometrically date is the typically the igneous rock. And what we do is date igneous rock above and below the layer that we're looking at. So we have a date range. So we're not actually dating the fossil. We're not actually dating the rock the fossil is in. We're dating the, rain, we're dating the rocks that are uh, above and below that. So we have a range. Um, that's why it's never, you know, it's called absolute dating because of the, the atomic clock, but it's actually just a date range. It's not an exact year. Um, let's see here. Uh, and when you're talking about every hair on a dog is perfect, it kind of reminded me. Um, so I don't know if this will make sense to you, but is every vertebra on a pig perfect? Because we have actually bred new vertebra and new uh, uh, rib bones into pigs. So it seems like we can mess around with that stuff. Um, and um, you mentioned something about how feathers don't shed. Um, actually, it's called molting. Birds do shed their feathers, exactly like scales. Um, and uh, most basal uh, animals shed their fur. Uh, hair is kind of a more evolved version of fur. Again, everything is a modification of something that existed prior to it. Uh, hair is an extremely thin scale. Feather is an extremely thin scale that has, uh, for lack of a better term, feathering on it. It's uh, broken up. Um, all you have to do is alter the biochemistry of those uh, anatomical placodes that produce hairs, uh, scales, and feathers, and it will produce a different uh, series of keratin connections. Um, as for dinosaurs to birds, uh, you don't actually have to believe that scales can evolve into feathers because dinosaurs already have feathers. Um, not just theropods, but uh, multiple dinosaurs. They have feathers. So I really want to discuss with you how come a dinosaur that we know already has feathers cannot get elongated fingers and bigger feathers on its, uh, on its uh, forearms. Um, uh, talking about eyes, um, again, this goes back to everything kind of evolving concurrently with each other. Uh, the brain is going to be basically primitive brains are just bundles of nerves and nerves are uh, just electrical connections. So the electrical connection will stimulate something else to happen. Um, in the, in the case of muscles, uh, the electricity creates a, uh, an imbalance in membranes and essentially that will flood in calcium and that will make the, the muscles, uh, start to move. And, um, and the same thing basically will happen with an eye. So uh, light will cause some kind of chemical change in a cell, and that cell will give off a chemical to a nerve cell, and that nerve cell, uh, well, nerve cells do what nerve cells do, and they carry an electric impulse based on um, the electric properties of the, the chemicals that are inside of them. You can basically change the polarities, and that generates an electrical signal um, in a particular direction. And any cell can pick up that signal and it's just a chemical process, a chemical exchange. Um, huh, maybe we can talk more about that. Um, but as far as a, a very primitive eye, it would just be a photosensitive patch and uh, an animal that would go towards the light for whatever random reason, it would evolve along that. Perhaps it, there's more food towards the light, perhaps the animal that hides from the light has a more better chance of uh, survival because um, it's easier to see, it's easier seen by predators in the light. Um, and you use three very similar bird species in your example, um, but I would like to you to tell me which of all of the birds are related and which are separate kinds. That would that's kind of more the challenge. Obviously, you think bananas are not like birds, um, and Harkening back to that, uh, the frogfish, I'll put it up again. 20 uh, seconds, 20 seconds. But uh, we know of fish that can walk. We know of fish that have articulated fins. We know of fish that can walk on land. So again, this is just repurposing of traits that already exist, modification with descent. All right. Okay. 
Thank you for your rebuttal there, Snake. Uh, you're right on time. So um, thank you, gentlemen, for your opening presentations and your rebuttal rounds. We're now going to get into the discussion. I do want to remind the audience to tag either Ron, Matt, or myself, uh, Standing for Truth, uh, if you have any questions for the debaters. So I'm going to set the timer right now. I believe that Matt had an extra three minutes to go into the discussion. So I've got the minutes set at 30 minutes and whatever one of you uh, gentlemen wants to start the discussion, I will start the timer then. Go ahead. All right. So I'm really most curious about um, what kind of limits you think are limiting a theropod from evolving into a bird since it already has all the structures and features that a bird has. They just need to be slightly modified. Okay. Well, the limits is the skeletal system, solid bone to hollow, the circulatory system, cold-blooded to warm-blooded, uh, the, the physiology of a leg to a wing. I, and I say this politely, you said just. It's all, you just can't wave your hands and say just. There's tremendous differences, of course, as you know, between uh, a leg and a wing. And uh, Taylor, everything I say is polite. I hear your stories. Where's the evidence? Why aren't they alive today, the transitions between a reptile and a bird? It's got to be real frustrating to think every transitional form is gone. The fossils don't exist. I just did a debate. On the fossils a, do exist. Okay. Well, I just did a debate where the, the man in China who had one of the most famous fossils admitted we had everything except the fossil of a feather. So, mm -hmm. uh some, the respiratory some system. dinosaurs don't have feathers. Some dinosaurs do have right. feathers. Do you accept that some dinosaurs have feathers? No, absolutely not. But okay, the man who did an article on it admitted they didn't have any feathers. Alan Fiducia, no, I know you've heard of him. He was, no, he was talking about a specific dinosaur. He was not talking about all dinosaurs. Okay, and I, I've got lots to learn, but I, I'm pretty sure uh, he does not, but I could look that up. That I believe he talked that there was no evidence of the dinosaur fossils. For but, that particular fossil. Right. Okay, like I said, I'll look it up. You know? Well, I can show you uh, fossil feathers on a dinosaur right now. Do you know what a theropod is? Yes. So it's not a, it, its leg is not becoming a wing. It has arms, right? Yes. Right. So why can't its fingers elongate? Well, it's digit. It's already got the same number. It could elongate. But how are you going to change the respiration system, the scales to feathers, the legs to wings? Cold-blooded to warm-blooded, you got a lot of Grand Canyons to jump across instead of just getting the fingers longer. Would you agree? Well, that's all modification of something that's already there. It's already got blood. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make is, so say that there was a dinosaur that evolved wings and it, did, it didn't evolve hollow bones and it didn't evolve uh, warm blood or anything. At what point would you say that it looks so much different from a dinosaur that it's not a dinosaur anymore? Well, that seems to be more philosophical. Birds, yeah, we know. But that, that, that's why we're trying I to understand each other. Right. So at I what have point? A okay, are you done? Uh, I have a definition of birds. Wings, feathers, hollow bones, uh, warm-blooded. Definition of reptiles. You gotta, you gotta, it's almost like a flea jumping across the Grand Canyon. You got about seven Grand Canyons to jump across to get from a reptile to a bird. And it's not just getting the fingers longer. But the respiration system, and I, this isn't an IQ quiz, and I enjoy talking to you. Uh, so it's not a pop quiz. You can you don't have to answer, but you understand the bird respiratory system, correct? A little bit, but uh, I, it's just a modification of a respiratory system. Okay, there you, you said the word just again. It's completely different. The diaphragm no. is lost. Air sacs are gained. It's single pass. It's a beautiful design uh, sorry so, so lungs are already air sacs and losing no. features is possible no the air sacs aren't the lungs the air sacs hold air so it pushes air through the lungs when it exhales mm -hmm. and, and my goal isn't you know a one-upmanship but google bird respiratory system and really ask yourself could this happen from a bellows system but the air sacs are, are not the lungs where there's oxygen to blood transport Okay. And honestly, I enjoy talking to you. You're a polite, respectful young man. 
Uh, well, that's really not the crux of my question. I'm asking at what point, how many features need to change? Is, is a theropod with wings no longer a dinosaur? Well, are you saying it's a bird? It doesn't matter what you call it. It's, we're just uh, looking at the morphology. If a theropod gets elongated fingers and uh, longer feathers on its arms, is that still a dinosaur or is it crossing into something else? And this is said politely, that's an English literature type question, definitions. I'm a mechanical type person. I want to see it become a bird. I want to see a reptile become a bird. Can not I answer the question? It's an English question. I, it doesn't make much sense. What if I said, if the respiratory, the wings, and the, the bones became hollow, then I would call it a bird. Well, dinosaurs I, already have hollow bones. I don't know if you knew that. I did not know that. They all have hollow bones? Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I don't know that. I'm going to write that down and look it up. So the reptiles with hollow bones. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's that, just a modification of a bone. Okay. Like I said, I will look that up. I, that is news to me. So uh, to answer your question, I need to see living evidence, fossil evidence of the transition, not a philosophical word and a bunch of drawings to explain it. But we do have these fossils. We have theropods with elongated finger bones and long feathers on their arms. Okay. I have yet to see the uh, fossils of the feathers and I will look that up. But, I can uh, show you right now. Okay. Here you go. I mean, everyone agrees Wait, that the Archaeopteryx. Everyone agrees the Archaeopteryx has feathers. Um, and this here. Yes. I oh Archaeopteryx, absolutely. Oh, I love Archaeopteryx. Mm -hmm. I'm so old. I knew about Archaeopteryx before you were born. Uh, what's that by the evolutionary model? You know what Fiducia calls it, right? I yeah. even have slides on it. He calls it a bird, a true bird, a strong flyer. He calls it paleobabble to think it became, it came from a reptile. Are you familiar with the paleobabble quote? No. So okay. th that's that. great. Um, the main point is if you think that that's a bird, then you already understand how a dinosaur becomes a bird because that is a dinosaur with feathers. That's not a bird. Okay. Well, I've got slides and quotes of uh, evolutionists who would disagree with you. And yeah, well, but, you, but you know right? that that's not the evolutionary position, which is why you're debating it right now. Well, doesn't fiducia have uh, any import? I don't really care. Okay, well, I because, think you're exposed because we to all know that there. we all know that evolution says that these are related. Evolution says that means every single evolutionist. Come on, you well, know that's, that's, what that's what evolution is. Okay, well, fiducia, Ellen Fiducia, North Carolina State disagrees with you. I don't think so. There's I'll some Google debate. It. There's some debate about uh, exactly what lineage Archaeopteryx is a part of, but there's no debate in evolution whether they're related or not. Okay, let's see. I will pull up my list. Otherwise, right you wouldn't be arguing against it. Uh, I just, I'm just seeking truth like you. I think you are. Okay, there's my Archaeopteryx. Can, I don't know if that's up there, is it? Yep, I see it. Okay. They had very strange traits that birds have today. Uh, stars, Olson, you've heard of him, right? One of the grander hoaxes of a Are you familiar with Stars Olson? No. Stars. Please write it down. He was the bird man in the United States. S-T-O-R-R-S Olson. He called it a hoax. The equivalent of cold fusion. Uh, Ellen Fiducia, world expert on birds. They tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird. And here's that paleobabble quote. And again, please look it up. No amount of paleobabble is going to change that. And there's many more evolutionists who do not embrace Archaeopteryx as an ancestor to a bird. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question now, guys? Mm -hmm. And we could talk more about that later if you want. Okay, uh, you said it was a waste of time to talk about the origin of life. Is that because you don't want to talk about it? You can't no, I'll, talk I'll about talk it? You, I'll talk to you about it all day. It's just that this debate is about evolution. Creation and evolution. I'm the creation guy. 
And creation talks about the whole baseball game, all nine innings. Creation talks about the origin of life. Could you give me just one and a half minutes on how you think life originated? And if it's a scientific answer. But that's not evolution. But it's creation and you're talking to the creation guy. But why would we be comparing creation of the entire universe to the change of life that is evolution? Well, the title of the debate is creation versus evolution. Creation I, is God. But I've already, I've already given you that God created the first life for the and purposes of this why did you give that? Because you'd rather not propose an answer? It's irrelevant. No, it's not. Truth is always relevant, Taylor. Always. It see- is, because if God created the first life, evolution can still occur. That's why most uh, people are both believers that God created life and believers in evolution, most scientists as well. So – are you going to say God created the first life or are you just granting it because you don't want to give me an answer? For the purposes of the, of every evolution debate, I always do that because it's irrelevant. Well, I don't think so. What is your best explanation? Just deal with the old guy on how life originated. 30 second answer will be fine. How life originated? Yeah. What's your best explanation? You weren't there. I wasn't there. A biogenesis has explained a lot of features of cellular components. Okay. Could you explain it? I've already said that I don't want to get into this because it's irrelevant to evolution. Okay. Well, and again, I respect that. I wouldn't answer it either because even if chemistry, physics, and biology could make RNA, DNA, protein, cells, organs, even if nature made a dead dog, it's still dead. There's more to life than physics, chemistry, and biology. And evolutionists can't even explain how the first peptide bond in a protein formed, much less that's, a beautiful that's dog. because that's not evolution. That's abiogenesis. It's a completely different field of study. Right. But in the big picture, uh, I know the books in the evolution section talk about origin of life. But I, and I know, and I say this politely, you don't want to answer it because you know you don't have a good answer or else you would answer it. No, it's because I don't want to waste time. It's not a waste of time. Truth is never a waste of time, my friend. And it's yeah, a when, when, you, when it's not on topic that it, that is. Okay, well, it was creation versus evolution. It wasn't the ninth inning of yeah, creation so, versus so evolution. creation versus evolution. So obviously, the topic is on life, not the origin of life, because evolution doesn't cover the origin of life. I well, don't know why you're comparing the whole big picture with only a slice of the pie. Because the big picture matters and it's the baseball game. The creationist, me, talks about every inning of the game. And, and, and I've talked to evolutionists. I know they don't want to talk about the origin of life. If they were playing Monopoly, they want to start on Boardwalk. But oh, we can have a whole separate debate on that. On the origin of life? Yeah. I would love to. And Okay, chalk that up. Yeah. I would be glad to. And again, everything I say is with respect. People can disagree. You learn more from people you disagree with than agree with. And I would enjoy having more talks with you. I totally agree. Good. You're a good man. (laughs) All right. So my main thing is I'm trying to understand where you draw the line here. Um, So you accept microevolution. So if there was a mammal that lost its hair, that moved its nostrils and that lost its hind legs and got a fatter tail. Is this the same kind of mammal? I'm just, I'm just asking to understand the terminology here to understand what the the limit of a kind is. You see my picture. I'm losing my hair. Am I changing? No, it's a joke. It's okay. Uh, Okay. Losing their hair, getting a thicker tail, Is it still cold-blooded, solid-bone, scaled, four-legged animal? It looks completely different. Okay, looks different. Uh, Once again, I'm not a geneticist, but I would need to look at the the DNA to consider how different it is. So which, which birds are not related to each other? I would be lying and bluffing to you if I could answer that. I don't know. You don't know any crustaceans where, where the lines are drawn there either? Nope, I could lie to you, but do do you think all birds are related? And I'm asking, do you think all birds are related to each other? Um, It's unclear whether they all come from a single bird 
or whether lots of theropods evolved bird-like features. Okay, and I know, I know, I read it, that the uh, amount of chromosomes in birds is about 80 and reptiles is about 20 to 25. Do all birds have the same number of chromosomes? I'm not sure about that. I, I would guess no. And if they didn't, I would tend to say, again, I'm an engineer, that they're not all related. That's what um, why is that? Because we, we know that uh, different numbers of chromosomes can occur from generation to generation. Well, I, I've heard of, uh, what is it, lupus or Crohn's disease or things like that. But what's the biggest change of chromosome numbers change? What example do you have? And I'm asking, I'm not setting you up uh i mean the most famous one is humans and apes well you're assuming we're related my friend we, uh, i don't believe we are not you see, not you really we're related and we have different chromosomes i'm saying we're not really. we have all the same morphological structures we have almost exactly the same dna except one of the chromosomes is fused it doesn't really matter what series your chromosomes are in as long as they are basically just balanced in the middle. So you can cut them up. It doesn't matter how many they are. there are. They all get right. read. It's the sequence of information in the chromosome, not the number. And, and I do agree with that. And uh, But you're saying there's no or small difference between man and ape? Uh, yeah, there's about um, not even a 2% difference in right. most well, of the proteins. Four. Most of the differences are a single nucleotide difference. Which winds them up in a cage where they, they can't have oral communication. They don't play golf. They don't do drive-by shootings. There's significant differences between us and the ape. And there's significant differences in ape cultures as well. I mean, they have different behaviors. They have different hunting styles. They have different societies. They have different tool usage. And do you think a human could reproduce with an ape? No. I agree with you. I agree with you. And uh, there are several rabbits that can't reproduce with other rabbits. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it, that, that doesn't actually mean anything. What we, act, we, we look at for a relation is morphology. And genetics, right? Yeah. Sure. But, sure. Uh, typically, I mean, most of the fossils we have no genetic information on. Let me see if I can find my... Let's see. I'm going to see if I can get my up here at time up oh, it's not doing it again oh, hang on there guys ah here we go now taylor i hope you enjoy this as much as i do what is the kind genetically they could produce an offspring it's often called the same kind would you agree with that well, you don't have to. By is your this, definition, yeah. Is this super rich mega model the same species as old Bill Morgan? Mm -hmm. Well, there's no way I would reproduce with her because I'm, I'm, a, I like uh, happily married. You know what I'm saying? Because of way people or organisms look, act, smell. Someone might say, hey, they're not reproducing with each other. They're a different kind or different species. But there are certain humans that will not reproduce with other humans based on ego, money, et cetera. You see where I'm getting at. But genetically, they could reproduce. I called John Sanford. I'm sure you know who he is, a Cornell. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, John, could a house cat's DNA be in vitro planted with a tiger and reproduce and he said most likely yes so to me they would be the same kind now in nature that cat's going to run for its life if it sees a tiger but the dna could produce a viable offspring and john i don't want to misquote john he said most likely so i think the gen genetic level is a good place to figure out what's the same kind now, do i get a question that's a decent starting place, but um, so for example, with the rabbits or the salamanders that can no longer reproduce, they're the same kind, but things lose the ability to reproduce with each other rather quickly. 
Right. This this is a, a cursed creation of mutation and loss. I agree with you 100%. But uh, could I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Now, I wrote it down as fast as I could. The, the question on human body systems, you said they tend to evolve together. Is that a science explanation that's uh, defendable or is that a philosophy statement? I mean, it's not just human. It's anything, but yeah. So the lungs and the heart and the liver and the stomach, they're all on the same journey together? Um. Not quite sure what you mean, but I think I know what you mean. Yeah. Well, we ha you have good lungs, you have a good heart, you have a good liver, a good stomach, good kidneys. How do they get there? I, I'd like to know how you think they, they came to be. And they Modif all support each other. They're just other. modified versions of uh, something that was there before. So well, cell, cells going all the way back to single cells when they uh, made the bridge to multicellularity. They can communicate with each other and differentiate differentiate each other's function. So, eventually, certain cells would proliferate uh, pockets of each other that were had similar functions, and that would be your origin of an organ. Okay, I hear words, but where's the evidence of this uh, grand story you're telling? The fact that uh, the evolutionary model, first of all, can predict uh, what kind of changes that we'll see where and when, um, and the fact that we know that uh, mutations can cause these kind of changes, can cause differences in the ways that cells uh, communicate, can cause differences in morphology, um, and the fact that we have examples of almost every stage in between what we're talking about. We have an example of these very simple organ systems. But you're not going to be able to tell me how a lung evolves, a liver evolves, and a kidney evolves. You're just going to say evolution, mutation, change, information. Well, no hard data. And again, I, I'm an I engineer. I like how, uh, uh, results. I'm a result kind of guy. We can start with lungs if you'd like. So a lung is uh, thought to be a, a modification of a stomach because fish have stomachs and they also have air sacs. So, and gills. They're just, they, yeah, they're modifications of something that's already there. So the, the organism already has the ability to create a sac within itself. It already has blood within that sac. The blood already picks up oxygen. It only takes slight modifications to have uh, thinner tissues, uh, an extra sac. All the end, it would just help maybe a fish grab a gulp of air when it goes to the surface and maybe it gets a boost of oxygen that way. And it's incidental. It just has an air sac that is just a little bit more sensitive to oxygen. And so the fish, we know of several fish that hang out on land. So those fish are going to get selected for more and more sensitive air sacs that are more sensitive to oxygen. Okay. And again, I think it's like the eye where you talked about all these so-called primitive eyes that already had the entire system in place. And, and I see where you're coming from. But you're saying, look at all these fish that have a beautiful system of respiration and digestion, circulation, just a few changes. But again, I'm asking how the whole system came to be. But we could even start with, hey, God created the first fish, but we already have all the systems that are needed to evolve. So, Well, what's keeping you from saying God created the first male and female 100% as they are 46 chromosome with the brains we have? What's keeping you from saying that? Well, it comes out of a storybook of mythology, and also we have a rich fossil history that shows the further back we go, uh, the human bones that we see look start to look more and more ape-like. So if there was no book, you might believe it, that the, you uh, disrespected, which is okay. I'm fine with that. The storybook is the problem, not a 46 chromosome human being. We run the zoos. We run the planet. Not, not well, I'm not saying. Well, there are tons of other mythologies that have other crazy ways of how humans got on Earth. So. Right. But, I, again, you granted me the first life, but for some reason you're not going to grant that the creator, we can call him, made males and females just like they are. Reproduction, I think, is the most difficult uh, thing to explain by an evolutionary process. What if the male evolved 200 years faster than the female? What if the heart evolves faster than the lungs? I think the thing is you're not willing to grant things. Like you said, you're willing to grant the origin of life. 
and I'm just going to say, I, I, I was an atheist at your age too. And, and that's not condescending. And one of the reasons I was, is I thought creationists were a threat to what I loved and I loved science. And I had been brainwashed to think like these nuts are going to hijack science, but it took many, many years of just looking at the data to just come to the conclusion. People make people, apes make apes. The best explanation, no, I didn't say absolute proof, instant male, instant female, every system, every organ working. But that's not actually a useful explanation. Just saying God did it. And that leaves us where? Nowhere. What do you mean? Whereas we can actually find out more about diseases and cure them based on evolutionary understanding. Well, diseases is microevolution, as you know. Uh, the flu virus mutates, it's still a flu virus. Bacteria mutates, it's still bacteria. So I'm but with that's you. Why, that's why I'm asking you, where, how far can microevolutions accumulate? Okay, but you, you did get me on the rabbit trail. There's no way that you'll grant, you granted me the first life, but there's no way you'll grant me male and female instantly created. Five uh, minutes. I'm granting that it's possible for a God to do that, but that's not a very good explanation and it doesn't give us much information beyond that. Okay. So, so looking at people. the fossil record, that doesn't make sense because we would just see humans all the way up. Okay. 8 billion humans. They all have human ancestors. Is that good evidence for you that humans can only make humans? Uh, they make, they only, yes, that's only make humans, but each generation is different. And yes. that's, that's how evolution works. Right. Micro. And they're still, they're still humans though. So every dinosaur only made a dinosaur and they only made dinosaurs. And eventually those dinosaurs were so different that we came up with this label of bird. But why out of 8 billion people are they only coming from human parents, human grandparents, human great grandparents? So this is kind of, I mean, I've asked you this a couple of times. How different would a human have to look before you would say that it's not a human anymore? I would have to talk to a geneticist that would look at maybe a police laboratory geneticist, a DNA person to say that. If we because turn green and got little elf ears and uh, would we would that be still be human? I would send the genetic information to John Sanford and have him tell me. Because looks can be deceiving, as you well know. Yeah, so if they lost the ability to breed with humans and they looked different from humans, but they obviously were modified from humans, is that a, a new ifs. kind? That's a lot of ifs. Well, I would say all the examples that we have of human reproduction supports, doesn't prove, the belief that humans can only make humans. Ladybugs can only make ladybugs. And you do agree flu virus is microevolution. And a lot, I'm, I'm positive a lot of creationists help fight the flu viruses. But all macroevolution is, is an accumulation of microevolutions. So the whale evolution, for example, is a mammal who's just losing hair, moving its nostrils, uh, and changing uh, the scale of some of its body morphology. Well, uh, I've actually studied a little bit a long time ago, and I have slides of it. We won't go to the slides because of time, of whale evolution. And all they have is drawings. And the honest drawings show what was found and what was assumed. And the size and shape of the so-called so whale evolution, which is contradicted by many other evolutionists, is far from satisfactory that they were even ancestors to whales. When did a whale uh, get or lose its blubber? The land animal blubber is just blubber, fat, right? Well, if it had that blubber on the land, it would overheat. If it didn't have it in the water, being a mammal, it would uh, have hyperthermia. Right. So that's why there's transitions. So there are mammals with a little bit of fat. And then, you know, there's like minks, muskrats, otters. They swim in the water, but they're still a bit terrestrial. They have a little bit more fat. And okay. the further you go out, the further farther they can adapt. So deep sea ones would, like a seal, looks a lot like an otter, but it's so just fatter. Okay. Well, when did the whale lose its legs and get those fins? On the leg, or on the land, or in the water? Uh, in the water. 
Well, at first it, it can't swim too well if it's got feet. And if it's on the land, it can't get to the water. And mm -hmm. you know where I'm getting at. We're two buddies having a nice discussion, right? There's so many differences between land animals and a whale. But do you agree they... that those changes can happen in a population? Can a population of f otters, for example, get fatter and lose hair? Yes, they're still otters. Okay, so what if they lose their back legs? If, if is a very important word. But it, I know. Did they? But is that kind of change possible in a population? Is it possible that uh, mutations can cause you to lose things? I agree with you mm -hmm. 100%. Uh, here's so, my little whale so if thing. An, if an otter population lost hair, gained a lot of blubber, and lost its hind legs, are you it still going to call it an otter? Yes, because it would have the DNA of an otter with uh, those mutations. Here's the difference between hippos and uh, whales. Lung capacity, the tail, the eyes the ears, the skin, the nostrils, the mouth, and of course the presence of blubber. Sonar, how in the world did sonar evolve? Uh, Taylor, you gotta admit that's a pretty good design. Uh, those are all just modifications of existing systems. Sonar is hearing, they already have ears. They just need more sensitive ears. Um, you say just a lot. There's well, a, just is a big gap. It's, not, it's really not, because we also have in the bat series, we have all of the uh, basal bats. They have, um, they have claws on all their fingers, and they have no echolocation organs, that the, the little bones that uh, bats that can echolocate have. Um, and as, if, as we go higher in the geologic column, we find bats that start to lose claws on their fingers, and uh, they have little fingernails on their fingers because they came from... Uh, terrestrial mammals, and they start to gain more sensitive ear bones. Okay, and echolocation is like vision. Collect the data, move the data, and then interpret the data. To me, that's a, a system and a, a design by a great designer, and not a step-by-step -step evolutionary process. So did, did God design humans to echolocate? Because some blind humans can do that. You know what? It's funny you ask that. I think humans can do a lot more than we realize that we have more senses than we do, uh, pheromones. You can sense if someone likes you or not, or doesn't like you or not. So I think God created us more than we uh, understand or we're capable of. That could be a whole nother debate. But I think we're going downhill as humans, don't you? We're devolving. Uh, we're potentially subject to no longer having necessary like selection pressures because we're the weak are not dying in True. You know, natural numbers. Um, yep. Yep. I agree. I was born cesarean. I'd be dead if it weren't for medicine in the 1960s, but I think it's a case of uh, decay, corruption, de-evolution that things are getting worse, not better. On a genome level. Would you agree with that? Well, I would say, again, it's kind of irrelevant from my perspective because we could just get evolution purely from loss of features. Um, for example, starting from a fish, mm. you just lose gills and you just lose, uh, you know, scales, for example. You just get skin underneath. Um, things like that. Yeah. Snakes but losing limbs. Whales losing limbs. Mm-hmm. And again, you're saying just a lot, and living evidence uh, is more important than hand wave and saying it just so happened. What living animal would you say is the best evidence for the theory of evolution? Uh, it's really not just a single animal. It's a interaction of all the data. And the fact that this hypothesis, this guess, actually is able to make predictions. So okay. it wouldn't matter if I pulled it out of my butt or not. If it's <laughs> able to make these predictions that no other model is able to do, then, well, you're on to something. Okay, let's say there's 8 billion people, say a million apes, zero transitions. A billion birds, a billion reptiles, zero transitions. What happened to them all? Are Where? 
I'm sorry. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna have to step in here. That's been um, about 35 minutes, so I'll, I will allow um, Taylor here to answer that last question from Bill. But then that will have to conclude the discussion portion. Thank you, gentlemen. So, do you mean um, evenly distributed in the fossil record? No, I mean uh, living in North Dakota, Bangkok, Korea. Hey, look at there's a transition between man and ape. They're not there. Well, it's simply when we look back into the fossil record, the older the human bones get, the more ape-like they get. But nothing until like we it. find only apes. Right. right. So, I, so that there's only one logical explanation for that. That there's no living evidence at all. It's all gone. Science relies on observation. Not yeah, hypothesis. That, and we observe that mutations can make changes to morphology and to biochemistry. Okay, Absolutely. gentlemen, thank you so much. That concludes the discussion portion. It was very lively, engaging, lots of good uh, topics, lots of good points brought up. So uh, thanks so much, guys, for making it fun. Um, we will now go into the concluding statements. And since Bill, Bill, you started, so we're going to let you start on your uh, concluding statement. So you have five minutes. I will start the timer on your first word. Go ahead, brother. Well, not the first word. I got to, the thing's not clicking. The other, what? Okay, hang on. <laughs> no problem. Whenever you're ready. Oops. Oops, my numbers aren't right. Okay, hang on. Closing. Okay, let me get my clock started. Go. First, I'd like to thank you. Uh, Taylor, like I said, I love learning from people who disagree with me. I, I enjoyed our talk. My life story real quick. I was born going to church every Sunday, learned a lot of Christian teachings. And I saw this for the first time in sixth grade in a book. I laughed at it. I said, humans are not related to apes. Three years later in ninth grade, my biology teacher taught it to me. And I love science. I love biology. And I said, wow, humans are related to apes. Why in the world would I listen to that book with all those rules that I don't like? So I said, I'm a man of science, and I uh, thought Christians were dumb people who didn't think. At the age of 26, I got a little bit of creation material. Uh, three years of research, I finally found it overwhelming that apes make apes, people make people. So it took me a long, long time. What are these? These are cartoon drawings. This is not scientific evidence. Drawings and stories is not science. What you observe is science. Now, the schools teach this. They'll say man came from ape, but they don't teach what the fossils were. Now, I know a lot of these have been proven to be frauds, but for many, many years, the so-called transitional form evidence was taught as a fact. A Piltdown man was taught for about 30 years. Question of the day. Why do the school books only show drawings and not photographs as proof of evolution? Uh, we just talked about that a minute ago. There's a lot of people, a lot of apes, a lot of birds, a lot of reptiles, zero living evidence. They would love to show photos, but there's nothing to photograph. A fun question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Two chickens, a male rooster and a female hen. They teach that in biology. How in the world could a reproductive system evolve? The reproductive system needs the other systems, and the male and female have to be at the same time, at the same place. I believe are the teachings of the Bible that God created male and female, and they had to be adults because babies are helpless. The big conclusion, I believe in a designer because of design. I do not believe the theory of evolution is sci not scientific. It hasn't been observed. Drawings and stories is not science. No living evidence, no fossil evidence. Dig into the details. Don't just say it just so happened. See if it's empirical. That's self-explanatory. It goes on and on. Genetics uh, glorifies the creator. Uh, going back to the questions, Taylor won. Taylor passed the number one, passed the number two. Uh, he believes we have single cell organism ancestors. Uh, Anyways, I'll just let you guys decide for yourself on how we answer those. I, I, I like the guy. I really do. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. There was a man in Indiana who was convinced he was dead. All the townspeople said, you're not dead. You're not dead. So they collected all the money they could get, and they got a really smart guy from Harvard to come. 
The guy from Harvard came out to talk to me. He said, are you dead? He goes, yes, I'm dead. He said, do dead people bleed? The guy said, no, dead people don't bleed. The guy from Harvard took out a pin, pricked the man's finger and it bled. He goes, well, I was wrong. Dead people do bleed. Some people are so locked into their conclusion, they don't care about the data and the evidence. My only request is people are open-minded and seek truth. Don't try to prove your conclusion. Seek proof. That's how I uh, found the, the Lord and God. This is said with respect. I've talked to many atheists over the years. Some people are atheists because of suffering. I understand this. Their mother died. They were physically abused for years. God, please make it stop. God, please make it stop. It didn't stop. And they go to war out of their anger. And I feel compassion for these people. Some people don't like the Bible's rules. Nobody does. It's called the flesh. Some people have too much pride to be humble to a God. A lot of peer pressure to be an evolutionist. A, a Taylor was respectful, but there is a lot of shaming out there. And some people sincerely believe humans have ape-like ancestors, bacteria, because that's all they've ever been taught and that it's science. So a question, the system of vision. Anybody watching this, ask yourself, does vision appear to be the result of a designer with an IQ of infinity or the result of nature with an IQ of zero? Okay. And in your life, are you going to believe drawings and words or are you going to believe your eyes? You can trust your eyes. People make people. Apes make apes. Pigs make pigs. Horses make horses. It goes on forever. The end. And Taylor, once again, you're a fine young man. I enjoy talking with you. All right, okay. standing must be AFK. <laughs> so I have five minutes. Uh, it was five minutes, right? right? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry there. I had, I had it on mute. <clears throat> thanks so much, Bill, just in time. Um, so thanks for that concluding statement. We will now move on to Taylor. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Sharing screen. All right. You guys see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the theory of evolution, again, it doesn't work simply by uh, drawing things on a page. We actually do have photographs of actual bones. Um, and again, I'm just repeating myself, but uh, the further back we go into the fossil record, the more and more human bones start to look like ape bones. And uh, if evolution was true, that's exactly what we would find. And um, so you can see how these are just modifications of the same basic morphology little tiny modifications. Um, on the right here is just the comparison of human and ape chromosomes. Almost all of them are exactly the same except for these two, which in humans um, is just missing this little part due to a fusion. Uh, this is just uh, to demonstrate how the, uh, a horse, horse foot is just a modification of other fossils that we find three-toed things, and we find transitions between three-toed things and one-toed things. So, again, modifications to existing traits can create new traits. So, for an example, a, a mass, a colony of single cells can evolve to just preferentially uh, mass up into colonies, and then they can lock their cell number based on genetic relation and they become a, a multicellular single organism. And once that occurs, this is just a demonstration of how cells in a plane can form a tube. So from that, we get worms. Again, every feature of every animal is explainable by the fact that other animals have features that, if modified, can produce those new traits. And again, it's not just drawing lines on a piece of paper it's the fact that we know traits can be modified and the fact that when we make these assumptions, these evolutionary assumptions that these fossils are connected, we find and predict the next uh, piece in the series in line. And creationism cannot do that. They can't predict what fossil will be in which layer because they're wrong about why it's there in the first place. They don't understand it. Um, going back to how 
a colony or some kind of sponge like material or uh, organism can form a tube that's essentially a worm and then worms at that point you can just differentiate cell function and create muscle parts legs would be a modification of the skin plus a muscle and fins would be a modification of the leg insects would be a modification of this basic worm with legs form and the fact that we find the fossils that bridge these transitions and in a date range that produces this pattern of evolution over time just confirms it even more. Uh, we have other examples. Embryology shows how morphology can change within the same exact organism, as well as it shows several um, vestigial traits. Um, whale embryos, uh, baleen whale embryos, they have baleen, not true teeth, due to a mutation. But when they're embryos, they have um, teeth that go away. And we can actually find that there are slots for teeth that these whales would have absolutely no use for um, because the baleen is a modification of such of like a dolphin type tooth. Uh, on the left here, we have a flying squirrel. It looks a lot like a bat. That's because this is a squirrel and I'm not sure if anyone can deny that this is related to regular tree squirrels, except this squirrel just has extra skin flaps. And so this is easily explainable by microevolution. Again, every transition is explainable by a modification of a pre-existing step. For example, uh, this is a mayfly larva. And just like the primitive worms, their legs, uh, the, the legs of primitive worms, sometimes resemble fins, like right over here. Um, so you could differentiate and have legs and fins. And what is what did these uh, become in insects? Uh, they become wings. Thanks so much, Taylor, for your concluding statement there. Thanks, guys, for an awesome debate. The audience had a great time. It was very respectful, very engaging. So um, our next portion would be the, the, the question and answer. So I do have a few questions for each debater here, uh, which I can get right into. It looks like um, the first question is actually going to be for Bill. Uh, so Bill, we're going to get right into it. Uh, the question is from Emotionally Stunted Emoticon. Um, for Bill, from what did llamas and camels descend if camels produce camels, and I'm just reading this word for word, Bill, and llamas produce llamas, how does your answer affect your dogs only produce dogs argument? And go ahead. Okay, once again, the thing I like about these debates is it uh, encouraged me to do more research. And it was just yesterday that I had read that camels and llamas can reproduce. And I'm not going to lie and say I'm an expert on camels and llamas. So I would say that they are of the same kind, that their genes, their genetic code, their genome allows them to reproduce. So what did it come from? Let's see, camel, llama, a camma or a lamo, whatever you want to call it. It's just an English word. But I don't know if I'm answering his question. Like I said, just yesterday, I understood they are able to uh, reproduce with each other and have an offspring. So I would say they're in the same kind. So and okay, awesome. else, I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate the answer there, Bill. Uh, we'll get right into the next question. Uh, this question is for Snake. So Snake, the question is, how do you explain the existence of time and matter go ahead <clears throat> well it has nothing to do with the topic but i'll humor you guys um so the existence of time and matter well what makes sense to me is the fact that there is something and anything at all means that there that absolute nothingness is actually an impossibility 
because if absolute nothingness existed at any time, it could never transform into something because if in absolute nothingness, there is absolutely nothing. There is nothing in it, nothing about it, which can become something. So the fact that there is something means that nothingness is logically incoherent. So where does matter and time come from? I don't know. I, I don't think it, you can explain it with a God either. I think we're just woefully ignorant about it. But my view of time is essentially the separation of matter. So from a, a perspective outside of all the dimensions, all, all points in time are essentially standing still or at all time branches, everything is, is at a single point in time. So um, it's hard to visualize or something like that, but uh, essentially it's all already happened. Time is stationary, but from our perspective, we, we can see causation because we're just a part of that entire thing. Um, and to me, it doesn't need a God because whatever caused it, whether you accept the first cause argument or whatever, um, I don't think it requires a mind to to uh, essentially pick out a point in time and just start seeing what happens within that dimension. So that it's hard to talk about all this quantum stuff, but uh, yeah, hopefully that that makes people understand a little bit. Can I do a twenty second comment, and he can comment on my answers? Of course, yeah, we will allow um, per question, um, you know, quick uh, comment from the other debater. Go ahead. Okay. Real quick, when I pose my questions, I always said, what's the best explanation? Because typically I'll say, how did life originate? People will say, I don't know. Well, I didn't ask you if you knew, I asked you for your best explanation. And so I believe the best explanation is a supernatural God, but I can't prove that I wasn't there. And I think Tyler, Taylor, I'm sorry, Taylor and I could agree no matter who is right in this debate, it's still a mind-blowing miracle. But I believe his miracles contradict natural laws of science, which falsifies a natural explanation. Yeah, I just don't think the supernatural explains anything and just trying to stick as closely to naturalistic explanations as you can. Um, that's, the, that's the best way to go. Okay, well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we'll go right into the next question then. Uh, this one is for Bill. So, Bill, um, the question is, how does Bill explain the existence of pseudogenes? Go ahead. Pseudogenes. Are, are those the genes that kids wear and they put holes in them? <laughs> I'm I just think kidding. So. I think I might have to clarify, but I think you're right. Oh, because <laughs> they're not real genes. Ah. Uh, I am not a geneticist. I took a uh, college biology classes and I would hate to give a bad answer. So if I could get a definition, I could try to get an answer. Um, I guess the best definition would be like inherited genetic mistakes. So for example, uh, they will say that apes and humans, for example, share oh. the same genetic mistakes in their genome. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Now I know exactly what they're talking about. All right. I have slides on this, but I won't go to the slides. There's two explanations. Well, first, you got to learn to separate data from interpretation of data. The data is us and apes could have the same mutation at the same location. That's the data. There's two ways to interpret it. One interpretation is, hey, that means we're related with each other. That's possible. Another explanation could be, that that point on the genome is susceptible to that mutation. Now, I uh, did a little research and uh, Georgia Prudhomme from Answers in Genesis, she's a PhD in molecular biology, and that's what she proposed. And for an example, this isn't her example, I could fall out of a tree and break my arm. An ape could fall out of a tree and break their arm. That doesn't mean we're related to each other. It means we're prone to the same deficiencies at the same location. So once again, the data is there. There's two ways to interpret it. I would say the interpretation is that that gene site, which the PhD at Answers in Genesis, Dr. Prudhomme said, 
is susceptible to the mutation at that location. So if I could respond a little bit, um, just here, here's like another example of a pseudogene. So the baleen in whales is actually a gene fragment of what is the tooth gene in like orcas and dolphins. Um, so I think a better interpretation of that is since whales share morphology with dolphins and since they have no tooth gene, but only a fraction of the tooth gene found in dolphins, it's a better explanation that they simply lost information in that gene and gained baleen. And loss of information is going downhill. The theory of evolution needs to go uphill. Create new I, I, information. I think that's kind of a semantic word salad. But uh... <laughs> Okay, well, let's go on to the next question here then. Thank you for your responses and your answers, guys. Uh, very informative. Okay, so the next question here is for Snake. This is from Ray Giordano. So I'm just reading it word for word here. Uh, apes, he says, apes, Y chromosomes are nothing like humans. Y chromosomes are past father to son, unchanged. Humans and apes, Y chromosomes should be almost the same. Why is this? Go ahead. Well, I think the Y chromosome has a higher rate of mutation than the other chromosomes. So, I mean... That, that's uh, perfectly compatible with the, the theory of evolution. Okay. And so then some gene elements just are more unstable than others. And I, they're studying that in the, the Y chromosome is actually has a higher mutation rate. And do you have a response to that bill or do you want me to go on to the next question? Remember what Brent Franklin said, right? Better to be silent and be thought of a fool than open your mouth and prove it. Uh, I don't have any idea how I would answer that question. Okay, Can you repeat well, it? I want to write it down. The Y chromosome in apes is significantly different than humans. He's pretty much just saying that the Y chromosome in apes is, is, is a lot different than in humans. I think it's about 70%. Uh, so his question is if, if they share ancestry, then the Y chromosome should be more similar. Yes, I have no comment because I have to research that. No problem. Okay, well, we're going to jump right into the next question then. Can, um, I, can I add one one sentence? Go uh, ahead. They're, actu they're actually pretty similar. It's just one of them has a little bit extra on one end. So awesome. that's all I wanted to add. No problem. Um, actually, uh, this is going to be uh, the last question here. It's another one for Snake. It is from Open Mind. So he asks, if evolution is not random, but survival of the fittest, why can you nor anyone predict anything in the future? I mean, evolution is supposed to be predictive, question mark. And I, re I read that word for word, so go ahead. I mean, there's lots of non-random things that we don't know how to predict yet. So just because... I mean, the effect that the environment has on selection is not random. But as far as we know, you know, the, the weather is pretty much random. We can, we have a little bit of predictive ability with meteorology, but um, we don't have the complexity to understand how whole biomes evolve. We, we know a little bit. We know, you know, if you take out a top predator, you'll actually, you actually might lose a bunch of foliage because it's no longer eating the, its prey, things like that. That's why they had to reintroduce wolves into Yellowstone. Um, but it's really, it's more complex than it's able to predict. So, but we could predict if we knew what the environment was, we might be able to predict, you know, so if, if uh, some, creature was being eaten by a predator, we might be able to predict that the smaller ones would be able to escape or the, the bigger ones would be able to fend off the predator, things like that. But we're not going to be able to predict when the next ice age is going to come, when the next big winter freeze is going to come, things like that. Could I give a quickie? Of course. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, great. Uh, as I understand it, evolution, the theory of evolution is a three-legged stool, natural selection, time, and mutation. Natural selection is elimination of information 
from a population. So that doesn't help the theory of evolution. Mutation is a loss of information in the genome. Uh, they can produce fewer proteins than they could before. That's not a help for the theory of evolution. And time, from what we know about entropy, is not a friend. So the three-legged stool does nothing to prop up the theory of evolution. Well, mutation creates uh, new sequences. So that can actually, that has created new proteins. New proteins are beneficial. Uh, I... Both. I, uh, Both novel and beneficial proteins. Sometimes uh, detrimental proteins in some environment are actually beneficial to others. Right. Beneficial, I have no problem with, but new, uh, that's news to me. That's something I've read up on, that mutations are a loss of information, but sometimes they can be a benefit to survive well, antibiotics, et cetera. It's, it's just a change to the sequence. So you can get deletion mutations, but sometimes you get substitutions, right. which is not necessarily a loss. Okay, gentlemen, well, thank you so much once again for your responses. A very good question and answer. A great, a great questions from the audience. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, once again, I want to thank the debaters, Bill Morgan and Snake Was Right. Thanks for giving us your time. Obviously, this debate would not have been possible if it wasn't for you guys. So thanks so much for making it fun and, and engaging. Uh, I want to do uh, one, one announcement, uh, August 23rd at 4 p.m. EST. Uh, we have emotionally stunted emoticon debating Dr. Ken Hoven on the global flood. So it's the global flood versus uniformitarianism. So make sure you guys are here for that. We'll have a couple trailers out uh, before the debate. So I'm going to hand it over to Praise I Am That I Am, who is the host here. Uh, and once again, thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, host. Yeah, thanks yeah, for hosting us. You guys here, I really enjoyed this. I plan to do this more. Um, so, yeah, if anyone in the chat wants to get involved with debates, get a hold of Standing for Truth or Raw Man because we're going to get this going here. Uh, yeah, I really enjoy the ho or the contestants here. So, um, yeah, just look forward in the future to like, subscribe, share, uh, and, you know, give us some love by, <laughs> you know, donating, whatever. So uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, showing up. And um, is there anything anyone else want to say before we end it here? Could you post my phone number? People can call me if they want to talk about this topic. Uh, sure, I could put it into the caption. Uh, uh, I could do that. Sure. I love talking about this. Like I said, I, I learn more from Taylor than people who agree with me. I enjoyed the talk. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that'll end that. I thank everyone again for showing up, and I want to say good night and God bless.